Nú ætlum við að venda okkur kvæði kross og sína viðtal sem ég átti við Nóam Tjómski. Hann hefur nú verið kallaður áhrifamesti þjóðfélags rýnir samtímans. The most influential public intellectual. Og það eru fleiri en eitt fjölmiði sem hafa gefið honum slíkar einhvunir. Þetta er frægu maður, hann er upprunlega málfræðingur prófessor við Massachusetts Institute of Technology setti fram kenningar um málfræði sem eru umdeldar en hafa haft gríðarlega áhrif en svo er hann líka þjóðfélags rýnir og hefur verið að beitt sér á því sviði í alveg síðan á tíma Vietnam stríðsins hann telur held ég sjálfan sig vera helst anarkista ef eitthvað er en við reyndum að fara svona nokkuð vítt og breytt yfir heimsmálin og þess er að geta að Chomsky kom hingað í bóði hugvísindasviðs háskóla Íslands Það er svona í tengslum við hundraðar amæli háskólans og ég kann þeim mjög góða sökk fyrir að aðstofa mjög við að koma Tjómski hingað í þátt hjá mér og við viðtal. En nú um Tjómski gerum þess vel. So, Professor Tjómski, it so happens that we are speaking, well, this will be broadcast on the on 11th of September. So it's exactly 10 years since we had the attacks in, in New York. And now people wonder what is the, uh, what is the legacy, what's the meaning of these attacks now that in, in hindsight? Well, it was obviously a uh, horrifying terrorist act, maybe the single worst terrorist, what we call terrorist act uh, ever. Uh, but it was very unusual also. The reason it was unusual was because of the direction in which the guns were pointing. Uh, this is the first time that uh, the United States has, U U.S. territory has been attacked since uh, 1814, when the British burned down Washington. Uh, we only attack others. They don't attack us. Uh, and uh, uh, in fact, more generally, for the, from the point of view of the West altogether, it's the first time there's an attack that came from anywhere but another Western country. You know, again, these are things we do to others; they don't do them to us. Uh, and it's, uh, and that, of course, is a matter of great significance. That's why it's called in the West uh, the day that changed the world forever. Yes. And in fact, there was, uh, if you look over the world reactions, uh, there was sympathy and concern everywhere, but in a good deal of the wor word world, the reaction was, you know, this is horrible, we're sorry you underwent this, uh, join the club. This is what you've been doing to us for centuries. And in fact, it's rather striking, because if you go to Latin America, this is called the second 9-11. There's a first 9-11, which is gone from the consciousness of the West, because we did it to them. That's uh, September 11th, 1973 which by any realistic dimension was considerably worse than what we call 9-11. And you can see that quite easily. Uh, as you know, I'm sure, uh, one of the planes, the Al-Qaeda planes, uh, was downed by passengers, very courageous passengers, managed to take control of the plane and crashed in Pennsylvania. It didn't make it to its target, which was Washington. Well, suppose that that plane had hit its target uh, which could have been the White House. I suppose that they'd hit the White House, uh, killed the president. Uh, I suppose that there had been a pre-planned uh, military uh, uprising, which took place and established a military dictatorship, overthrowing the democratic regime. Uh, and suppose it then uh, killed uh, thousands of people, uh, tortured tens of thousands of people, uh, established a major terror center in Washington, which was carrying out uh, assassinations, overthrowing governments uh, uh, all over much of the world. Uh, I suppose they brought in a group of economists uh, who, within a couple of years, just drove the country to it, one of its worst uh, economic crises in history, and on. Uh, that would have been worse than what did happen, and it did happen. Yeah. It happened on the first 9-11. It was an event, as uh, Henry Kissinger told President Nixon, of no historic significance. It's of course the uh, U.S. initiated and U.S. backed uh, overthrow of the uh, parliamentary regime in Chile and the installation of the Pinochet regime. Uh, 
The only thing that's wrong in the analogy that I just mentioned is that the numbers should be uh, 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 multiplied by about a factor of 25 to make it per capita equivalent. But we never had, well, we had Abu Ghraib, we had Guantanamo, we had Iraq, we had Afghanistan, but we never had this clash of civilization that was talked about. And actually, if you look at 9-11, the clash of civilizations was partly manufactured. I, th I, th I thought then, and I think there's much more evidence now, that there were much better alternatives. Uh, in fact, uh, if you look at the specialists on Al-Qaeda, like uh, Michael Scheuer, the CIA agent who'd been in charge of tracking Al-Qaeda for years, he's, he's written about it, first anonymously, now recently he's exposed himself. Uh, uh, he says that uh, George Bush was just following uh, bin Laden's script. He said the United States has been Al-Qaeda's best ally. Uh, Al-Qaeda's plan was, their hope, was to uh, convince their constitu the potential constituency. They regard themselves as a vanguard which wants to mobilize a constituency. Constituency is the Muslim world. And they were trying to convince them that uh, the United States uh, is on a crusade to um, attack Islam. You take a look at polls now. In fact, one just an international poll just came out a couple of weeks ago. Uh, there's fear and anger at the United States because of the feeling that they're attacking Islam. Bin Laden won a, won a victory. Uh, and there were alternatives. Uh, if you, at the time, the 9-11 uh, attack was harshly criticized within the jihadi movement, very harshly. Uh, I could go through the details if you like, but some of the leading clerics were uh, extremely critical. Uh, and it would have been possible at that time, I, I think, and, but more significantly uh, specialists on the topic think, like Fawaz Gerges, that it would have been quite possible to isolate the militant jihadi movement at the time yeah. and bring the Muslim world, almost all of it, into uh, support for uh, w uh, wiping out this uh, militant tendency. Instead, it's escalated enormously. And in fact, the actions that were taken uh, very consciously increased terror. So for example, the invasion of Iraq, um, we now know from testimony at the British Chilcot inquiry you know, into the background and uh, uh, material from intelligence services that uh, both the CIA and British intelligence and in fact, French intelligence uh, predicted that if the US invaded Iraq, it would increase terrorism. It did, by a factor of seven in the first year, according to government statistics. These are victories for, uh, uh, for bin Laden, as are the uh, roughly $4 trillion expenses for the, uh, uh, for the two wars and maybe double that for homeland security. I mean, he never expected he's going to conquer the United States. The plan was to bankrupt the United States, to trap it, to f bring it into what was called a trap. So he was largely successful? He was very largely successful. It's yeah. not just my view, incidentally. You can read mm -hmm. people like uh, Scheuer and other yeah. specialists on Al-Qaeda who say exactly that. So e American power was undermined by, by the whole affair? It was undoubtedly undermined. I mean, there's no question that it's weaker now than it was 10 years ago. And this is not the only factor, but it's one factor. But what happened while they were looking at the, the Middle East, at the, the, the Islamists, was that China rose. They actually... Well, uh, that's we part of it, but that's, I think, exaggerated. Yeah, the rise of China is, of course, significant, but the idea that power is shifting from, uh, you know, the U.S. to China, I think, is a gross exaggeration. China is a very poor country, which faces all sorts of difficulties. Uh, it's... Uh, go through it, if you like, but... Uh, uh, it, uh, uh, there has been spectacular growth, but they have internal problems uh, that the West uh, are totally non-existent in the West. And in fact, China itself, its economic growth, if, if you take a look at it, it's primarily as an assembly plant. So there's a lot of concern in uh, Europe and the United States about the trade deficit with China. Uh -huh. But when the trade deficit, I don't know about Europe, in the United States where it's been calculated accurately, in terms of value added, turns out that the trade deficit with China goes down about 25 percent and it goes up 
with Japan, South Korea, and Taiwan, about 25 percent. I mean, they're supplying the advanced parts and components, the yes. high technology, uh, as is the United States and Europe. Yeah. And it's being assembled in China and then uh, shipped out. Actually, there's some careful studies of it, and they're pretty interesting. So you think these these ideas of, uh, of well, Chinese world dominion are, are exaggerated? That's an illusion. I mean, look, they're... Per, uh, their per cap take a look at the Human Development Index of the United Nations, uh, which comes out every year. China, the last time I looked, was ranked about 90th, I think, uh, right next to El Salvador, uh, you know, a Dominican Republic. I mean, it's a very poor country, and it has uh, enormous internal problems, uh, unrest, uh, labor strife, uh, ecological problems. It has a major demographic problem, which is well known to analysts. Uh, the Chinese growth period, the last roughly 20 years, uh, had a huge demographic bulge in uh, people, young people ages roughly 20 to 40, the basic workforce. That's over. It's now declining. Uh, so that demographic benefit that they had is going to be a thing of the past pretty soon, plus many other factors. So yes, it was it was a spectacular growth period, and there are other aspects of it that aren't really too well recognized outside of the, you know, the technical literature. So it takes a uh, mortality. There's been a very sharp decline in mortality in China, but it was during the Maoist years. The decline was sharp from 1950 to about 1980, and it was very sharp because of rural hygiene. Um, health programs, barefoot doctors, hygiene. Uh, starting from 1980, it's leveled, and by now, mortality rate is actually higher than it was in 1980. Uh, it's, it's a complicated story. It's not the way, you know, the yes. ideology presents it. And you find it very quickly as soon as you look into the details. I'd like to speak about President Obama. Well, he was voted in with, with hope, but why is he such a disappointment? because the hope was a complete illusion. I don't say that in retrospect. Uh, even before the primaries, I was writing about him, just using his record and his website. And it was very clear that uh, this is uh, uh, public relations. In fact, uh, the uh, public relations industry knows it. Uh, you may know that uh, shortly after the election, uh, every year the advertising industry gives a prize for the best marketing campaign of the year. Yes. He won. He beat out <laughs> Apple computers. Yes. And uh, if you read the business press, like, say, the London Financial Times, major business press, uh, they were quoting uh, executives who were completely euphoric. They said, we have a new model for public relations, for deceiving the public. It's going to change the atmosphere in corporate boardrooms and so on. So, yes, they understood perfectly well. Uh, he won primarily because he did receive the largest, by far the largest, support from the financial institutions. That's kind of the core of the economy now. In 2007, they actually had 40 percent of corporate profits, and they preferred him. So they poured money in. And elections in the United States are mostly bought. Uh, you can predict almost completely who's going to win an election just by looking at campaign funding. But what do you think about the political atmosphere in, in America? We have this, this debt crisis. We have a... We don't have a debt crisis. That's more propaganda. Is it? Okay. Take a look at any of the serious economists. Yeah. I mean, at, well, to be precise, there's a long-term debt crisis. Yeah. But there is no short-term deficit crisis. And the debt crisis, yes, it's long-term. It's due primarily to Ronald Reagan and George W. Bush. Uh, Reagan was uh, spent, had fiscal policies were just totally wild. He tripled U.S. debt. He turned the United States very quickly from the world's leading creditor to the world's leading debtor. Well, during the 1990s, that was kind of leveled off a little bit. And in fact, uh, Clinton left off with, with a slight budget surplus. Then George W. Bush came along and uh, radical tax cuts for the rich, uh, wild spending, you know, so there's more debt. Now, the deficit, which is not the debt, that's something, that's a short-term phenomenon. Mm -hmm. And yes, there's a deficit, uh, but it's, 
it's not the major problem by any means. I mean, mm -hmm. joblessness is the major problem. Yes. Uh, and if there was any interest in dealing with the deficit, uh, the sources are pretty well known. I mean, about half the deficit is due to military spending. But there's so much discontentment in America. There's, so there's much discontent over do joblessness, Hate not, it. not the deficit. Yeah. Uh, you, you take a look at polls. People look, the, 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 the actual unemployment is in some sectors of the economy at the levels of the Great Depression, and in many ways worse. Uh -huh. I mean, I'm old enough to remember the Great Depression. My family was mostly unemployed working class, and it was, it was pretty bad, but it was hopeful. There was a sense we're going to get out of this somehow. There were things happening that made it look as if there's a way out. Uh, that's missing now. There's a sense that we're not going to get out of it. And that may be correct. Uh, manufacturing industry, which is sort of the core of an employment economy, that has been very consciously undermined and uh, off, moved offshore. Uh, it's great for the corporations. They make a huge amount of profit. Uh, but uh, it's ter um, for, for the work, for, for, the, for the population, uh, since Reagan, since around 1980, uh, real wages have mostly stagnated or declined. Yes. Uh, there is enormous wealth, but it's in very few pockets. I mean, uh, everyone knows that the U.S. is highly unequal since roughly 1980. But what's less known is that the inequality is largely driven by a fraction of 1% of the population, a sector so small it's not even picked up in census figures. Uh, economists have to do elaborate analysis to figure it out. And what it means is, uh, if, if you look at who these people are, they're uh, CEOs, you know, heads of corporations uh, who are paid way more than in Europe, uh -huh. uh, hedge fund managers, uh, you know, financial manipulators and so on. And people who do nothing for the economy but are absorbing a huge amount of uh, whatever wealth is produced while the population is... Uh, you know, it's, it's not suffering like the third world, but uh, people don't measure themselves against the Stone Age. They measure themselves against what the world ought to be like in their richest country in the world. And yes, they're very angry. And unfortunately, the anger is taking uh, extremely dangerous forms. Dangerous forms, you say? What are those? Well, you want to see what forms it's taking, just look at the uh, front runner for the next election. Uh, Rick Perry, governor of Texas, is highest in the polls, well, way higher than other Republican candidates, but higher than Obama, too. And take a look at his policies. Uh, Rick Perry is, uh, of course, he's a climate, deni climate change denier. I mean, his state, Texas, is burning up, you know, but he says there's no climate change. It's all a hoax, liberal hoax. That, that's dangerous, not just for the United States, but for the world. And, in fact, he's riding a wave of denial of uh, climate change. The new Republican Congress, the ones that came in 2010, almost entirely climate change deniers. Uh, furthermore, with him, it's kind of a matter of conviction because he, he's associated with a extremist Christian evangelical set which is preparing for the second coming in our lifetimes. Uh, so it really doesn't matter. And what has to be done is to uh, uh, eliminate the demons who are controlling the society and the world. Uh, uh, maybe 25 percent of the Republican Party thinks Obama may be Antichrist, you know, and uh, uh, it wants to get rid of the income tax that destroyed the country, it wants to get rid of popular election of senators, you know, yeah. shouldn't be allowed, uh, uh, get rid of um, you know, Social Security, of course. Uh, all of these are caused by demons. Um, uh, he, he does get the support of the business classes. I mean, they can't they think he's, he's crazy, but uh, he's kind of like a, you know, his, he, he leads the attack on unions, on uh, uh, Social Security, which they hate, on uh, the limited medical care that exists, uh, and uh, cut back on taxes for the rich. In fact, the tax system is extremely regressive by now. You take a look at Bush's tax cuts, uh, more than half went to the top few percent of the population and they're fighting like anything to keep those you can destroy everything else but don't stop the tax cuts for the rich well all of these programs I won't run through the whole story but uh, implementation of those programs would 
not only severely harm the United States, but it would severely harm the world. I mean, if, if the United States refuses to do anything about climate change, the world is going to suffer. There isn't going to be any constructive way of dealing with this if the U.S. is not only dragging its feet, but going backwards. I mean, Perry and the Republicans in Congress are right now dismantling the very limited legislation to deal with uh, uh, carbon emissions. They're dismantling it. They want to get rid of the environment, Environmental Protection Agency, which incidentally was instituted by Nixon. Okay. Yes. And in fact, if you look back uh -huh. at U.S. politics, yeah. the last liberal president was Richard Nixon. Yeah. If he was in Congress now, he'd be considered way off on the left. Yeah. There's been a very substantial change, and there are reasons for it. But have the, the corporation and the financiers, the bankers, have they, they totally taken over American democracy? Well, I wouldn't say they've, you know, they're extremely influential. I and mean, if you go back to, say, 1907, I mean, there was a, a very substantial growth period, what economists call the golden age, yeah. 50s and 60s. Very rapid growth, uh, relatively egalitarian growth. And there were, of course, banks at the time. But they did the things that banks are supposed to do in a state capitalist system. I mean, what a bank is, uh, I won't talk about Iceland, but what a bank is supposed to do is take uh, unused capital, like, say, my bank account, and uh, uh, distribute it to productive uses, like starting a business or buying a car or sending your children to college or something or other. And that's pretty much what it was up until roughly mid-70s. Uh, since the mid-70s, the, and they were... A, fairly small part of the total economy. Yes. Uh, by now, uh, there was a major shift in the U.S., British, and to a substantial extent international Western economic system at that time with an enormous growth of financialization, of financial speculation. Uh, it had to do with uh, elimination of the controls on uh, currency uh, through the early period. It was the Bretton Woods period. Yes. There were uh, currency was re pretty much regulated. Uh, then it was freed in, in the early 70s. Uh, uh, capital controls were banned. They'd been used all the time. And uh, uh, the, the, there was a tremendous growth of speculative capital. And that led to a concentration of capital in financial institutions. And concentration of capital translates into political power. Uh, that's as old as Adam Smith. And that meant that legislation was passed, which accelerated the concentration. Uh, uh, fiscal policies like taxes, uh, deregulation, uh, rules of corporate governance. It set in motion a, a kind of a vicious cycle, yes. which keeps feeding on itself, uh, leading to very high concentration of economic and political power, substantially in the uh, financial organizations. Uh, and stagnation or decline for everyone else. It's dramatic since Reagan. Also, since Reagan, uh, there were repeated financial crises. There were none in the 50s and the 60s because the New Deal regulations were still in force. When they were dismantled, of course, you start getting financial crises and bailouts and so on, each one worse than the last. Uh, at the same time, the cost of elections started to skyrocket. Uh, that just drives both political parties into the hands of the pockets of the corporate sector, mostly financial sector. Uh, I think I mentioned by, 19, by 2007, right before the crash, uh, financial institutions had about 40 percent of corporate profits. And they don't, it's, un, it's unlikely that they contribute anything to the economy. They may harm it. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, but they're, and, uh, again, uh, you have your own experience. But it's a general fact, and, and there are reasons for it. I mean, if you take a look at serious economic theory, it's completely predictable, uh, very predictable. I mean, in, when you institute market-style systems, uh, most of the system is not really a market system, all kind of protectionist measures and state interference, but the financial sector did move to a kind of a market system in these years. Now, in a market system, uh, if you make a transaction, you suppose you sell me a car, let's say. Uh, if you and I have our, we're paying attention, uh, we'll arrange the transaction so that you and I benefit from it. But we don't pay any attention uh, to what are called externalities. 
to the effect of the purchase on him, let's say. And there is an effect, like there's an extra car on the road, there's more pollution, you know, gas prices go up, and that magnifies. Well, that's negative externalities. Suppose you're a CEO of Goldman Sachs. If you make a transaction, you uh, recognize that if it's a risky transaction, you know, might cost you. If it's, if it's a ris risky transaction, it's going to make high profits, but of course there's a danger that it'll crash. So you take care, if you're paying attention, you take care of the potential losses to yourself. You do not take account of what's called systemic risk, the risk that if your transactions go bad, the whole system collapses. But that's exactly what happens, yeah. repeatedly. So what you're doing is underinsuring systemic risk, and that virtually guarantees financial crises. Now, for, say, Goldman Sachs, it's not a problem, because they may talk free market, but they believe in a powerful state. They want a powerful state which comes to their rescue, which is what happens repeatedly. After every crisis, the taxpayer bails them out. And in fact, if you look closely, the credit rating agencies today, actually, when they rate uh, the value of a corporation, say Goldman Sachs, they take into account the likelihood that it'll be bailed out by the taxpayer if their risks go bad, so they're ranked higher. All of that encourages, uh, encourages the behavior, which is, for simple market reasons, almost guaranteed to lead to crashes. And we're now preparing for the next one. Yes. Well, the politicians, politicians seem to be unable to, to tame this, uh, this, this beast. Oh, they're able to tame it, all right. They choose not to. Yeah. And in fact, when these politicians are, like, say, Obama, put into office by uh, funding from the financial institutions, they're unlikely to do it. I, I, I've only barely skimmed the sea surface. It goes beyond this. I mean, the political parties in the United States used to have internal rules. So, for example, if, you want, if, you, if a member of Congress wanted to move into a more senior position, you know, head of a committee or something, uh, it was based on a service, seniority, and so on. Uh, with the Republicans, that changed about 25 years ago, and the Democrats are not far behind. By now, you have to buy your way into a yeah. committee chairmanship. You have to pay the party if you want to be a committee chairman. Hey. Now, how do you get to pay the party? You go into the same corporate po pockets, which means you're indebted to them. But, but and uh, if you take a look, say, at the climate change issue, uh, there's enormous propaganda, which in incidentally is quite public. They openly announce it by the major business lobbies, Chamber of Commerce, which is the biggest one, and others, to try to convince the public that none of this is happening. And that there's a lot of propaganda coming out. Uh, the media repeat it, and uh, uh, people are either confused or they begin to ask whether it's really true. Uh, this is part of an anti-science wave. Why should we believe the scientists? You know, that kind of thing. Uh, uh, all of this is combining. It's converging. It's uh, giving a kind of vicious cycle which uh, leads in extremely dangerous directions, unless it's aborted. You know? Well, one of your most famous books is uh, Manufacturing Consent, the book on the, the media. What about the, the role of the media? That's, well, you know, take, say, uh, New York Times, you know, major newspaper. I mean, it debates climate. It, it does publish the opposing views on climate change, more or less equally. So on one side are, you know, 99% of the scientists. Uh, on the other side are uh, some crazed senator, Jim Inhofe, who says it isn't happening, and you know, half a dozen scientists who they can pick up as you can on any topic. Mm. Well, the public reads this, and it's, uh, it's kind of he said, she said, you know, yes. two views. Uh, how do we make up our minds? Well, why should we mm. trust these people yeah. anyway? Well, that's what the media is all about these days. That's it's, what's called... It's, he, he says... We, yeah, we, except, we, see, there's an there's yeah. underlying principle. If you go to a journalism school, the best journalism schools, you're taught a concept of objectivity. You have to be objective. And objective is defined. Uh, if something is being discussed, what they call within the beltway, you know, in the Washington system, uh, if it's being discussed there, like if it's disputed by Republicans and Democrats, you've got to report both sides accurately. Uh, suppose you have a view that's not in the beltway, 
Well, if you report that, it's biased, it's sentimental, it's uh, not objective, and so on. So take, say, climate change. 98% uh, of the scientists happen to be outside the beltway. And this is true on many other issues. I mean, let's go back to the deficit for a minute. Yeah. I mentioned that about half of it is due to military spending, which is just outlandish. The United States spend about as much as the rest of the world combined. But the other half is more interesting. The other half is traceable to the completely dysfunctional health care system, which is an international scandal. It's privatized, it's unregulated, and it's about twice the per capita costs of say, European, other industrial countries with some of the worst outcomes. Well, it's been calculated by some good economists that if the United States had the same kind of health care system that, say, um, France, Germany, other Western countries have, uh, not only would there be no deficit, there'd be a surplus. But that's not discussable inside the Beltway because it affects the power of the financial institutions the insurance companies and so on. It happens that a large majority of the population has favored it for a long time, but it can't enter into the political system. You could see it in the debate on the health care reform the last couple of years. Uh, the idea that you should, uh, a, a large part of the public depends on the poll, but quite a large part, often a majority, wants a national health care system. Uh, that's not even discussed. Uh, Obama did have a there was a proposal, the Democrats had a proposal to allow what was called a public option so people could choose to join Medicare, you know, the general health care system as a choice. They wouldn't have to go to insurance companies. It was supported by about two-thirds of the population. Obama just dropped it. He didn't, it was, you know, he didn't say to the public, okay, you want it, I'm going to push for it. He said that essentially to the insurance companies, I'm not going to allow it to happen. So it's, you don't even have the option. Well, that's the deficit. That's why I say if they wanted to tame the deficit, which is not a high-order problem, unemployment is the high-order problem, a very serious problem, uh, they could. But it, it doesn't fit the needs of the people who Adam Smith called the masters of mankind, the people yeah. who own the economy. I'm going to ask you a large question, which is basically what what in your view, are the largest problems facing humankind? Humankind? Yeah. Well, I think that's easy. Yeah. Uh, there are two. Uh, we're, we happen to be at a stage of history which is unique. Uh, we have the capacity to destroy the, de the species, in fact, or at least decent life for the species. And there are two major uh, aspects of this. Uh, one, which has pretty much been around for 50 years, is nuclear war. It's a kind of a miracle that we haven't had a nuclear war. If you look at the history, it's come very close a number of times. Uh, if, uh, in fact, it's being, and it's being increased right now, the risk. I'll talk about it if you like. But uh, it's real. Maybe it's not a high risk, but if you have a low probability event that's continually recurring, the probability that it will happen is very high. Yes. So there could be a nuclear war. That's one. And that one we know how to deal with, at least in principle. The other is environmental catastrophe. I mean, the International uh, uh, Energy Agency just a couple of weeks ago uh, came out with an estimate of uh, greenhouse gas emissions last year, highest ever, even though there was a recession, so less manufacturing. But more significantly, they they estimated that uh, it's reaching uh, the point of uh, probable raising of global temperature, say, within the century by two degrees centigrade. Well, that's what the scientific consensus has argued is the threshold. If we get to that, it may be irreversible. And we're verging on it. Yeah. Now, that's not going to de destroy all life, but it could very well destroy viable existence for much of the society. I mean, these are huge threats. You are giving a lecture in, uh, in Iceland. Uh, what will you be speaking about? I was asked to speak about 9-11, uh, naturally. Uh, and I'll speak about, actually the title gives it away. Uh, the title that I submitted is uh, The Two 9-11s and Their Historical Significance. And there are two. I mentioned them. And they 
each have historical significance. And it's also significant that the West only recognize one of them. That's also significant. Uh, it uh, grows out of a long imperial history of centuries. And it's very dangerous. Uh, the, uh, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about what the alternatives were, which I think were real, and how the... Uh, I'll also talk about the uh, uh, Osama bin Laden assassination. Yes. Uh, you know, it's a very unpopular position, but I, I think it's a crime. You know, I don't think you assassinate suspects. And he is a suspect mm -hmm. in Western systems of justice, in theory at least, until a person is sentenced, he's a suspect. Now, he could have been apprehended. Everyone agrees to that. He could have been apprehended, could have been brought to trial. Uh, he wasn't. The choice was made to assassinate him. It was a planned assassination. Uh, dumped his body in the ocean, no autopsy. Uh, uh, that's guaranteed to increase uh, anger and skepticism in the Muslim world, yes. just on obvious rational grounds. You know, why kill him and dump his body in the uh, uh, ocean? Well, the natural conclusion, which is a lot of people believe it already, is they had no evidence. Uh, so the action was undertaken in a way which increases the belief that Osama bin Laden really wanted to implant, that they're trying to destroy the Muslim world. They're attacking Islam. Uh, did you at all follow Iceland's predicament after the, uh, the collapse? Well, we some people say that we would like the uh, the sort of the canary in the coal mine, that the one that sort of fell first. Yeah, it's also interesting the way pa Iceland responded to it, essentially refusing to pay the debts. That's what it amounted to, and of course that, that's the second country to have done that. The first was Argentina, around 2000. They were they had followed IMF rules. They were the you know, the poster child, done everything right. Uh, lauded by all the economists, and the economy totally crashed because it was completely unviable. Uh, they couldn't, uh, if they'd paid off their debts, they'd be one of the poorest countries in the, in the world. Instead, they essentially defaulted. They call it restructuring, but essentially said, well, we're not going to pay. And they've been doing fine. So got the highest growth rate, one of the highest growth rates in the world. Yes. Uh, it's uh, Isn't not, that what not recommending it, no. but it's an interesting... No. Yeah. Interesting observation. Yes. Uh, and uh, 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 the policies that Iceland was following were totally mad. I mean, I think that's now recognized, so I don't have to argue it. But they were based on crazed free market illusions, uh, which made absolutely no sense, and of course burst. Uh, Iceland is not the only one. I mean, the same happened in the United States. Uh, during the last 10 years, uh, I mentioned that when Clinton left office, there was actually a slight budget surplus. Uh, that disappeared with Bush's fiscal measures, enriching the rich and, uh, and the military expenditures. But there's something else that happened. Uh, a housing bubble began. Yes. And there's a reason for that. Uh, people, it has to do with the stagnation of incomes. Uh, people's wealth, such as it is, is in their houses for most of the population. And house prices started to go up, and there was predatory lending. You know, the, the lenders, the banks, uh, they figured, okay, we'll lend money freely even to people who can't pay for it. Then they carry out what's called securitizing the mor mortgages. You divide the mortgages up into, you know, a thousand pieces, and you sell them off to somebody else, and uh, the hedge funds come in, and you have got end up with some arcane system which nobody understands, and it's not even clear who owns the mortgage. And they figure that if it all busts, the government will bail them out, which is, in fact, what happened, which just encourages more of this behavior. Well, the housing prices started to skyrocket. Uh, there's about a hundred years of records of housing prices, and they pretty much track gross domestic product or close to it. Mm -hmm. Around 2000, it started taking off uh, way beyond uh, 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 gross domestic product. Uh, th there was no economic reason. There was no fundamentals behind it. In fact, rents stayed s stable. That's what you ought to measure it against. So if any economist had their eyes open, they would have seen that there's something deeply wrong with this.
a few economists did, a handful, almost all didn't because they are in thrall of a religious fanaticism. It's called the efficient market hypothesis. Uh, markets are efficient, period. And therefore, if this is happening, it's got to be efficient. So the, the Fed, you know, Federal Reserve, Greenspan, Bernanke, uh, with the support of almost the entire economics profession, said this is fine. Can't be anything wrong with it because whatever market's doing must be right. Uh, Iceland is similar. Markets are saying it's fine, so it must be okay. Uh, you ended up with an $8 trillion bubble, which burst, means that $8 trillion of wealth was lost suddenly. Well, you, you know what that does to an economy. It also helped to bring down the world economy. You know, there similar things were happening. Uh, I mean, there's a real fundamentalist faith. It's kind of like Christian evangelical faith. Yes. And it's kind of interesting that even after it, the whole edifice collapsed, mm -hmm. it's still maintained. The faith is still there. The faith yeah. is still there. Yes. Well, Professor Chomsky, I know you will also be speaking about linguistics while you're yes. here. With you are, you're one of the most influential linguistics of, uh, of all times. But well, we're you. not going to discuss linguistics here. Thank you Thanks. for being on this program. Glad to talk to you. Mm -hmm.